Thanks to Raycom for sponsoring today's video. No matter where I decide to park my butt, you can't hope to escape the Raycon ad. Their everyday E25 lineup are quality Bluetooth earbuds that are about half the price compared to other premium earbuds out there, and they sound just as good. Celebrities and musicians stand by them. Melissa Etheridge, Rich the Kid, Snoop Dogg, Mike Tyson, the Raycon Pantheon. And there's a bunch of colors to pick from. I always recommend the red ones, and their sleek, compact design fits nice in the ears, giving you a great noise-isolating fit. And I mean that, too. You shake your head all you want and they ain't falling off do i really gotta do that every time i talk about these hey hands off that drink hey. I need it for later. They last around six hours on a single charge, but the carrying case itself can be charged to give you more hours of playtime on the go. Use them during your next workout routine or when you go jogging in the woods, which I ain't doing at this time because I'm recording this promo at 4.30 in the morning. And Raycon's offering all my viewers 15% off right now. Click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash somecallmejohnny to get 15% off your Raycon purchase today. There's also a 45 day free return policy so you can make sure you find the right pair for yourself without breaking the bank. Thank you for supporting my channel as always. Let's continue on with the show. Well, I'm back at the new place. It's the beginning of a new chapter in my life and the next chapter for the Final Fantasy Marathon. It's the last game of the NES trilogy. And like last time, it's another entry we here in America did not see initially, and what a gap! This was a 1990 release in Japan, around the time we got the first game localized and released over here. You'd think that when the Final Fantasy Origins collection was made, that was when we were gonna get the actual third Final Fantasy, but that never happened. You see, the versions of Final Fantasy 1 and 2 in Origins were primarily based on their Wonderswan release. Final Fantasy 3 was also slated to have a Wonderswan remake, but that would get eventually cancelled, and thus, no Final Fantasy 3 for the Origins collection, not even for the Game Boy Advance. No, it wasn't until 2006, fucking 16 years after its first release, where Final Fantasy 3 was finally recreated from the ground up on the Nintendo DS, though throughout the years it would also see release on a bunch of other platforms. And like Final Fantasy 2, the reason why we didn't see the game originally was because of the company's attention on the Super Nintendo. I already went into that whole thing during the Final Fantasy 2 video. You can catch that here on the card up top if you don't feel like doing a regular ass Google search. And as for the basis for this review, I wanted to spend time talking about both the 8-bit original and the re-release. Until this video, I never touched the Famicom version. I thought that'd be reason enough to play it. And the 3D iteration is something I haven't played since it first came out. I never finished it, and the only reason I can think why was because Final Fantasy V was seeing release on the Game Boy Advance just a couple of weeks prior, and I love that game. I will say now that Final Fantasy V is a better Final Fantasy III. Oh boy, let me uh, just get this ready. Okay, can I just say that I'm shocked that Square has seemingly recoiled after their first attempt with telling a story that went beyond four warriors getting their balls polished to save the world. This story is back to basics, I mean the basic of basics. Earthquakes have begun to rock the world and during an expedition into a cave, four kids find themselves falling into a pit where they soon come across a crystal of light. The voice inside informs them that they've been chosen as the new warriors of light, for the balance between light and dark is starting to wane, with the flood of darkness threatening to consume all life if left unchecked. They are bestowed new jobs, allowing them to practice in all sorts of mystic arts, and after getting the blessings from their friends and family from the town of Ur, the four set off to restore the balance between light and dark, and folks, I shit you not, that's really it. Four kids setting off to save the world, a degree more complex than the original Final Fantasy, but only by the smallest of fractions. The kids have next to no character to speak of and see no growth throughout the journey. They'll chime in on occasion, they got hearts, they mean well, but uh, not many layers on these Onion Knights. And the remake doesn't make it much better. The kids are given actual names and now one of them is a girl, so I can complete the SGB reference by adding Sabrina- Oh, no, fuck, wait, I can't fit her whole name. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sabina. They only bother giving them one character trait, though. Luneth wants to fulfill the crystal's destiny, as every good hero would. Ark just wants to prove his courage. Refia wants a life outside of being a blacksmith. And Ingus wants to protect his kingdom. That's it. That's really it. 
The townsfolk and guest characters you come across are not much better, but some have more significance. Every now and then a plot important character will join your party, and no it's not like Final Fantasy 2 where you level them up for a bit only for them to fuck off an hour later, they're just along for the ride, all tucked away in the bottom right of the menu screen there. You can converse with them to get a little flavor text and get some hints to where you have to go, I always appreciate that. There's Princess Sarah, yeah, just like Final Fantasy 1, a girl looking out for her kingdom after the citizens were transformed into noodle people by the Jin's curse. There's Sid the airship engineer, gives you an airship to get things moving early on until a rock gets in your way, and instead of just learning to fly around it, we just fucking ram into it, nuking the ship in the process. Thanks a lot, Sid. How are you doing that? Thesh here is kind of a womanizing sleaze at first, but after slowly recovering from his bout of amnesia, he starts to remember that he's destined for greater things and even helps the party escape the Tower of Owen by seemingly sacrificing himself to keep the tower from exploding. He's cool though, don't worry about it, I think they already went overboard with the death quote on the last game. We're taking it easy for now, I stress, for now. Prince Alice is a 10 year old that's left in charge of the Saronia Kingdom after his father goes a little mad and forces his soldiers into a civil war that looks more like a colorful chess game. Oh, but look at this cute little dude in his ill-fitting outfit. But cute vibes or not, it doesn't stop his father from almost murdering him in his sleep. But then it's revealed that the father is being brainwashed by this Garuda here, and fuck this fight. Fuck this fight so hard. I'll get there later. But alright, who's, who's left? Alright, this girl named Arya, who, god, I thought for sure was gonna have more of an impact. She has her own personal theme for one thing, and it's fucking fantastic, I love it a lot. And she even has her own little spot in the opening FMV of the 3D remake. So clearly, she has some importance, and in some way she does. So a cool little thing about the world of Final Fantasy 3 is that things are not as they seem at first. Like the main world, the one the kids have grown up in, it's actually a floating continent, far above the world below. But you soon learn why we're on a floating continent. The world below is not on the right home about because it's been almost entirely submerged in the ocean because the main villain Zandi used a water crystal to flood the whole thing. It's like Wind Waker, only you know for sure this time that the instigator of the flow was a jackass. Alright, so as your journey to save the world takes you to the surface world below, Wait, hold on, why did I write it like that? You come across Arya and her caretaker. She's willing to help you liberate the water crystal to save the world, but then after managing to help out, she's killed by an arrow meant for the kids. This is all in the span of like 15, 20 minutes after first meeting her, I wanna say. Pretty fucking quick is my point, and I know the plot is already thin, but I was expecting her to stick around a little longer. With the water crystal restored, the rest of the world is back to normal, and I mean lickety split. As soon as you leave the shrine, folks are already up and about selling new weapons and items, and I was so confused. Until it's explained that the flow of time for them froze when the world sank into the abyss. I mean, alright, not sure how things sinking correlates to time stopping, but whatever magical fantasy land shit, I dig it. On the hunt for the last crystal, the kids are assisted by the eccentric duo of Doga and Une, former apprentices of the ancient sage Noah. So get this shit, the whole kicker of this plot is Zandi here, as I mentioned before. Zandi was also an apprentice of Noah, and one day, as a graduation gift I think so anyway, Noah bestowed each of his students with a gift. Doga was given vast knowledge of magic, Une was given control of the dream world. Like Freddy Krueger, I'd imagine. And Zandi was given the power to die. What? Needless to say, Zandi felt extraordinarily cucked by this gift, and who could blame him? What the fuck kind of gift is mortality? You can die now, isn't it great? No, not really. I get that Noah probably wanted to teach Zandi the beauty of life, live with what you got and appreciate it while it's there, but since we know nothing of Zandi's upbringing, who he was as an individual, whether he was someone deserving of such a gift, it just comes off as a humongous dick move from Noah. It makes Zandi in some way unintentionally sympathetic, but not that much because the story never fleshes things out and I still want to stop the guy because the world is clearly on the brink of collapse because of his actions. In fact, one of the coolest things Final Fantasy 3 introduces in terms of the lore, but never really goes into is the idea of the balance between light and dark. If one side becomes too great, it causes a calamity, and it said that centuries ago there was too much light going around where it caused a whole flood of the stuff to consume everything around it, and it wasn't until the four warriors of darkness that showed up and used the respect of dark crystals to restore the balance. I ask you, fellow Final Fantasy XIV players, does that at all sound familiar to you? Yeah, oh my god, after playing this, I realized how much Final Fantasy XIV took from this game. It's fucking fascinating. I thought they just, you know, had the Crystal Tower stuff, but no, man, it's all there. And I don't want to get into the XIV spoilers, at least it's not yet. Give me a decade. But if you want to see the potential Final Fantasy III could have had, then man, fucking play this game. Did you know the free trial now includes the award-winning Heaven Sword expansion? And oh, fuck me, sorry, I gotta go to the bathroom. When you lose the weight, you realize... 
uh, your alcohol tolerance isn't what it used to be. So after the last crystal is restored, the kids gather their might one last time and take the battle to Zandi, who is nestled safely on top of the crystal tower. After what feels like a fucking eternity, the kids face Zandi head on and manage to score the big W, but then it turns out the forces behind Zandi's actions have a mind of their own. It is Zandi, right? I'm not mispronouncing that, right? I don't know. I'm too deep into this rabbit hole now, forgive me. The cloud of darkness, the one empowering Zandi the whole time, is determined to have the scales tip towards the darkness and sink everything into the void, where nothingness excels and all that shit, and I could have sworn she was green not orange. But this little bout is short-lived, the kids get their shit pushed in, but thanks to their friends wishing them all the best, they manage to get back up, they manage to infiltrate the world of darkness where the cloud of darkness presides and with the help of the warriors of darkness, who are suddenly now a thing in this plot, the onion kids wipe out the cloud of darkness once and for all. Oh, there we go, there's the green color. The world is saved, peace is restored, a lot of calories are burned running in circles a whole bunch, it's a joyous day and scene. Like I said, damn simple story, multiple steps back from Final Fantasy 2, which I know that itself wasn't too deep, but there was more of an effort felt in delivering a story there. This may sound a little weird, the four kids traveling the world doing what they can to save the day, little story, little characters, just a bunch of moments strung together. It's like Earthbound or Earthbound Beginnings if you want to mash the hardware. I was reminded of those games a bunch, and I don't mean that as a dig, even if I didn't find much enjoyment in those games, I understand that it was different, it was doing its own thing, and it was a matter of whether I liked those moments or not. In this game, yeah, you know what, there were a couple of things that got me to chuckle. I fucked with this cannon in the Vikings base more times than I like to admit, just go up to a press a button. Woo. These dancers will put on a little show when you talk to them, nothing as extravagant in later games, but you gotta respect the roots and all that. The kids ask if it's cool if they can sleep in the princess's bed when she isn't around. I say fucking go for it, it's a free stay, I ain't paying for that shit. In certain towns you can play the piano, much to the crowd's pleasure or disdain, but the one in a more has everyone for no fucking reason go, oh this is my fucking jam, and then they all start to boogie down. Probably want to ease up on the alcohol, speaking of which. You think this is enough to fool the censors at YouTube? Final Fantasy 3, oh my god, this game, it starts off so good, it starts off so good, and even now, before I really dive into it, it's the best of the NES lineup. It's not just back to basics with story, but it's also gone back to basics with gameplay. And while that sounds backwards, in this game's case, that means refining what made the first Final Fantasy great and adding some quality updates to make it less stupid. Yes, no more smacking each other in the face to grow your stats or casting spells repeatedly to make them stronger. You kill things, you earn experience, you level up, and then you learn more powerful spells and get better equipment as you visit more towns later in the road. Thanks for that. Much appreciated. Towns and other major areas, especially early on, are almost always rocking these springs that fully heal you and revive dead characters. No churches or clinics, just throw some water in their face and they're right as rain. There you go, buddy. Inventory is less of a hassle. Items stack once again, giving you more room to finagle with things. Key items in the Famicom version still share the same space as regular items, but that's not the case in the remake, so at least they got that right. If you're really pressed for item space though, Final Fantasy III, Brought us the fat fuck, the fat chocobo. I'm sorry about that, buddy. You can find these guys in chocobo forests scattered across the land. There's way more of those now to boot. You feed him a carrot and you can just shove all your unneeded shit down his throat for safekeeping. I assume he eats them and not, you know, go the other way around. Shoving it up his ass, I'm talking about shoving it up his ass. For the third time, battle progression is turn-based, watching your characters act out their commands after you hand them out, and watching the enemies do the same. The front and back row mechanic has been tuned so that physical fighters can now deal damage from the back without being a completely used condom. And now, fighters will also retarget an enemy if the previous one died in the middle of combat. They did it! They finally got rid of that shit! For the physical fighters, because that ineffective shit still applies to magic users, god damn it, almost had it there guys. Almost had it. Still, it's great that I can just smash the A button and have all my fighters attack with reckless abandon for grinding sessions, it's a godsend. The update to the interface is good too, for the first time ever in the series damage and restoration values are shown on the battle screen, making the battles a little snappier. I would have used a different color for damage other than pink. It's fucking impossible to read at times, but the returning asphalt background makes it legible most of the time. 
The battle system is great, but it's also got some snags. Previous games had ambushes where the enemies get to attack first, but this game also has back attacks where the enemy not only gets first dibs, but your formation is also reversed. And if you had those squishy mages in the back row all safe and sound, guess what? Their assholes are now front and center, primed for the rupturing. But you can now switch your formation mid-battle to make things less dangerous and annoying. Uh, just remember to switch formations back when the battle ends because your positions don't reset after a back attack. God damn, there were so many battles where I had my mages in the front and the fighters in the back because I forgot to reset my formation in the menu. The job system is this game's bread and butter, so let's talk about that for a bit. The introduction of the job system. You know, the first game, you can choose which jobs your characters were for the journey, but that was it. They were stuck like that until the credits rolled. You went with the thief? You poor fuck. In this, you can swap between any job you want as long as you have the capacity points to spare. You earn these after winning battles, and for some it doesn't cost much CP to make the switch, but for others, especially if it's radically different than what you did beforehand, they can get a little pricey. The remake would draw capacity points altogether, but they replaced it with something even worse if you ask me, the job adjustment phase. I call it job sickness. You have to do a certain number of battles with the job before your stats return to normal. Until then, they're overall weaker in battle. I think it's supposed to be a means to prevent players from abusing the system, but in a game that requires you to be certain jobs to get through dungeons and puzzles, this is more of a hindrance than a balancing mechanic. Oops. You start off with the classic set of jobs from Final Fantasy 1. The fighter, the monk, red mage, white mage, black mage, all except the thief who you don't get until you liberate the fire crystal a little later. And while I like to think of that as a dig at the thief's effectiveness in the NES game, no, actually the thief is damn good in this game. I like them. They got great agility, meaning they can get more hits in their attacks. They can actually steal items from enemies this time. Most of it was potions, but still, I didn't pay for them. They also have the flee command, which guarantees a retreat from any battle that can be ran from, which is also when you just want to get the fuck away. And it also helps mitigate one of the dumbest fucking things this game does with running from battles, the defenseless debuff. For some fucking reason, when you choose to run, the party's defense drops to a flat zero, meaning any attack that enemies happen to land until the flee attempt is successful is- God damn! I don't even think about running from battles unless I have a thief in my party. It's not as if the odds of running are just as laughably low like in Final Fantasy 2, it's just, I don't want to get fucking smacked and dropped to the floor. Starting with the second crystal and beyond, your list of jobs expands greatly. I didn't experiment with all of them, I just went with what I was comfortable with. I only have so much time in this mortal coil. Early on, it was the simple Final Fantasy 1 formation, a fighter for damage, a monk for more damage. I don't understand why they give monk weapon drops and they always do their best with their bare hands. Like these tomfos and nunchucks just might as well be treasure drops. But I also had a black and white mage for elemental spell coverage and healing, everything that a person needs to- <laughs> Oh, they brought back the spell charges. The spell charges. Why? When Final Fantasy II had the infinitely better magic points. Oh, I honestly thought Final Fantasy I was the only game to have these. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Yeah, they give you more spell charges. A lot more, actually. And okay, that's a little better. But why go back to this? And there's no fucking ethers in the game either to help you restore them in the middle of a dungeon run. You either gotta use those rare elixirs or it's a bust. That's a bit extreme, isn't it? Same goes for the Phoenix Downs. Granted, if you look high and low, you can get about 20, 30 of them, I think. I had about 15 or so by end game. So there's some breathing room, but why put a finite number on items like that? I get that elixirs were always the rare full restore, but that was circumvented with ethers and such. Without those, it just feels like it's being overly punishing to mage users. You know what I also just realized? There's no tents or cabins or houses in this game either. It's like, I'm happy for the restoration points and the low cost of inns in the nearby towns, but sometimes, you know, I don't want to make the trek back to a town. I want to camp out where I am right now so that I can keep things moving along. What the fuck was I talking about again? All right, right, the job system. So yeah, there, there's a decent number to pick from as you keep playing the game, but some of them are just better versions of previous jobs. Not that I'm complaining too much. I like to think of it as the job upgrade you got in Final Fantasy 1 only without the stinky ass rat tail. That was a weird fucking moment in the game, wasn't it? But the fighter eventually becomes the knight, the black mage becomes the warlock, the white mage becomes the devout, the monk becomes... 
Wait, what is this? The Karataka? I never heard of that until now. That's so cool. I dig the cape, too. It was a pleasure to see new abilities and quirks that would eventually become Final Fantasy tradition. How the knight could cover weakened allies, saving them in the pinch. How thieves can open up locked doors without needing magic keys. I fumbled around with different jobs for a time. Fucking Greg here went from Monk, Dragoon, Dark Knight, and then the Ninja towards Endgame. Such a masculine identity crisis there. Sometimes it was out of curiosity. Most of the time, it was because I was pretty much forced to. God. This is where Final Fantasy 3 really begins to drop the ball. It's the first game with the job system, I'll give it some leeway, but in this game jobs are not so much for customization, but using them as keys to solve puzzles. It's too early on too, there are a few places that require the mini spell to shrink the party in size and trek on through. Many characters can't attack for shit, so it's heavily encouraged that you switch everyone to mages to lay on some damage. You know, you just gotta gather up some extra gill and purchase some spells that you now suddenly need to get by. Though if you play your item management right, you can convert spells into items and give those to other players who have spell charges to spare, assuming they can even use them at all. You can also swap an entire spell payload with another character to the same effect. In those longer dungeons, I kinda like the feel of that, it was a way to get around the spell charge limit even if that whole idea is dumb. The game will, at times, essentially force you into playing different jobs for a predicament, and these are never, ever fun. The fight against Heine requires a scholar because they can use their scan ability to decipher his weakness, which he constantly changes through the battle. The scholar class itself, though, is fucking worthless. Alright, it's more like I didn't want a scholar in my group because I didn't have any of their spell tomes. I didn't think it was ever going to be mandatory, just preferred. You don't need to, but... You need to. So I had to make my fighter a scholar. It was basically on scan duty while the others pelted him with the appropriate magic and I just barely scrapped by because I was almost out of spell charges for all my casters considering I was at wit's end at a dungeon that had no save points or other means of recharging my spells. Oh, oh, I can't wait until the next game. This shit needed to go after the first Final Fantasy. Then, oh my God, the ancient cave, the cave of darkness. Enemies here can fucking split or divide into multiple copies, each with the same stats as the previous one, so it ain't like there's diminishing returns on this shit. Every time you strike them with something that isn't a Dark Knight's katana, they're they're splitting up, filling the screen with more and more bullshit, and some of these formations are impossible to run away from, to which I mean, they are programmed so that they're inescapable. So what happens when you don't have a means of dealing damage to them consistently? You're fucked! Which, by the way, it's very possible you can run into these kind of formations before you're able to get the means of dealing with them appropriately. The battle against Garuda requires that every party member be a Dragoon to even stand a chance, which, to go easier on this example, they give you more than enough warning. Through townspeople warning you, the amount of Dragoon equipment you can find inside treasure chests before they encounter- Alright, alright, I'll make a party of Dragoons. And one white mage, I need my healing options, I want my healing options, but that was a mistake. Going against the developer's wishes, I barely win the fucking battle because this asshole just spams this thunder attack, which hits for absurd amounts of damage, so you gotta have everyone use that jump command and just pray he doesn't get his turn before everyone else leaves the screen. There's no strategy to this shit. That's just praying to RN Jesus. Fuck that. It's instances like this that left such a sour fucking taste in my mouth. Or it could be the booze, I don't know. Besides that, the game was going great. It was Final Fantasy 1, but better. The music was aces. It's an awesome soundtrack. It's got some seriously great town themes and sinister dungeon themes too. I recommend the town of Amor. It's one of my favorite town themes now and the castle of Heine. The saving grace of all that scholar bullshit. I get the feeling this game was pushing the Famicom to its graphical limits. The new sprites for all the characters and the new jobs were awesome to see in action. Look at the new magic animations. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's good to see that a healing spell actually looks like a healing spell here. Some of the larger goons and monsters were also a treat to the eye. Shout out to Thanatos here, going after my ass, even with their head underneath their arms. But even the small fry had me giggling. Look at this fucking fish here. It's like, you see this shit? You see what I gotta fucking deal with here? Outside of those times where I had to use specific jobs, you know, battles are going by fine. I never played a Final Fantasy game where shields were so secondary. Why would I use a shield when I can use two swords? What's better than one knife? Two knives. Double the power, double the fun, and it makes battles go by faster. Sometimes the best defense is making sure nothing survives before it hits you. I got these little indicators here that lets me know what targets I chose with what character. I was getting some awesome summons added to my lineup. Sure, the only one that matters is Bahamut, but it was cool seeing the origins of all the other classic summons like Titan and Shiva. 
And Odin, wait, where did Odin go? Dungeons will no longer fill with twisty, turny, I'm gonna make you waste your fucking time level design. No more trap doors, and they'd show what the asshole monster in the box is for a bit. Just for a bit. I just wish the game wasn't trying to give me a seizure whenever I ran into an enemy encounter. I'm sorry, I can't help it. It's part of the game's design. Don't full screen this shit. The vehicles were cool. Chocobo's back for ground travel. Got a canoe. I think I used once. I got an airship that I crashed into a rock. I get a boat that can later transform into an airship. I call it the airship. Then I get the Nautilus, which is an airship that did a line of coke, it's so fucking fast. And it can also go underwater, submarine travel, the first game to have it. Not much to explore, but the idea is sound, and I don't gotta worry about some ancient weapon fucking ambushing me like an asshole. Near the end though, you get the Invincible. I love that name, it's a big boy that's slow as shit, but it houses a free rest point, it's got... Uh, Vending machines full of items and spells, a fat fuck for item storage, and it could jump over mountains. Wait, how how is that a feature? It, it can jump over- just fucking just keep it at that altitude, stop with this jumping shit. But you need that feature in order to get to the final part of the game and- <laughs> The Crystal Tower, a part of the game I've heard so much about from other folks, and it was like, oh I know the Crystal Tower, it's that place where people just ignore every fucking mechanic in the game, no. It's not like that. You can't ignore anything in here. It's an absolute marathon of a dungeon that has no save points and a shit ton of bosses. Hell, it's an even longer journey if you decide to do the Eureka dungeon beforehand. Do the fucking Eureka dungeon beforehand. It has all the best weapons in the game guarded by bosses that aren't too much to deal with. You get to the end of it and you get the Sage and Ninja classes which outshine every other job by such a large margin it's almost cheating. The Ninja can equip everything and the Sage can use every magic spell and summon in the game. This is a goofy looking party formation, isn't it? But you need these classes. You absolutely do, and don't tell me you managed to get to the end with your scholars and geomancers. I'm glad that you've shown that you got nothing else better to do, but I don't care. You gotta get these classes, get all those bases covered, and then get ready for the gauntlet of your life. I used an emulator for this with the speed ups and the save states, and it still took me over two hours to get through this place. I figured I was at a good enough level as is. The normal encounters weren't giving me much shit, but I wanted to fight everything along the way anyway and earn some extra EXP. I earned a couple of levels as I was getting to the end, but then I got to the end. I fight Zondi and he puts up a bit of a fight. That fucking Meteor spell, man, Jesus Christ. The day isn't saved though, you got the cloud of darkness showing up, so you gotta fight her, but if you don't wanna immediately die when you take her on, you gotta liberate those dark crystals, meaning Four extra boss fights. More if you decide to open up those treasure chests that have those ribbons because they have Zondi clones inside who are just as tough as normal Zondi. It's a Zondi bargain sale. The Cerberus isn't too bad and Echidna isn't terrible. Got a serious case of plumber's crack going on there. But the Aramon, oh my god. He has a set rotation of attacks, but one of those attacks is Meteo, which hits so fucking hard it might as well be a goddamn screen nuke. Then this, this fucking two-headed dragon, no gimmicks, just god. Every physical attack is basically death. What kind of shit is this? This is the tail end of this place. You might have elixirs and, and phoenix downs to spare, but what the fuck does any of that matter when you barely get the time to use them? Oh my god, I actually managed to win that fucking roulette wheel. But then I get to the cloud of darkness and it's just flare wave, flare wave, flare wave, Flare wave, she only has one fucking attack, and the damage is so high that my sages can't keep up with the heals, even with Cure 4, the best healing magic in the game. For some reason, despite it being a full heal when targeting a single party member, it's so weak when you split it up between party members. But four or five hundred points, this bitch is hitting me for fifteen hundred plus every turn. Oh Christ, I can't, I can't do this, I'm underprepared. No, fuck that, I'm more than prepared. I got the ultimate classes, I got the best equipment, but none of that means shit because my level isn't high enough. I didn't grind enough. It wasn't a problem before, but now it is. Oh, man. I wanted to stop playing there. The thought of doing that all over again. 
The thought of going back to Eureka to buy more of those shurikens for the ninja. They're seriously amazing one use weapons, but I can only buy them from this dude at the end of the fucking dungeon and they cost so much money. There was a bit, a consideration where I thought about using Game Genie codes to just artificially get my levels up just so I can get to the end, but I decided against it. One, because I couldn't find any codes worth a damn, and I didn't feel like bothering my tech friends to fuck with hexadecimals and all that. I love the experiment. This one's for you, baby. Second, I thought, all right, John, you're already using an emulator. Just run in circles and speed that shit up. What else can you do? So I did that. With the speed up feature and over an hour later, I went from my mid 40s to low 50s and I tried it again. Can you imagine? Can you even fucking imagine how long that would have taken as originally designed? I make it through. I still get wrecked by a couple of things, but finally, finally, I was able to beat the cloud of darkness through the numbers game. I guess as intended. Oh my God, I did it. I beat the game. Wait. Oh, why is the ending scroll crop like that? Is it an emulator issue? I didn't play this on Nesticle like God warned me against. In the beginning was the void. Hen, light and dark were made. Very thing was born. Then Tars, moon, water, fire. In life. Uh, life gave birth. Oh, something more eviting the light and dark and energy called hope. I me washes away all reams. Despair, love. Uh, do not be swept away. Ook instead to that place. Oh, the light which shines after all else is gone. Hope. Do you remember how I said I wanted to look at the remake too? What? My experience in the Crystal Tower turned me off so hard from the idea. This is where I decided against it. I know things are better balanced overall in the remake. I mean, it's still got the stupid job sickness, but the game is more manageable altogether. The guest party members will actually chip in from time to time and help with random encounters, saving you on resources. It's also got a three enemy limit on encounters, so even those stupid split monsters aren't too much of an issue later in the game. It's a great time until the fucking Crystal Tower. I hear it all the time from my friends. It's just as bad in the remake. The super long marathon of dungeons with limited healing options, no save points, and think this ain't on an emulator. I played the version on Steam. Good version too. Nice and clean, runs smooth as butter. But if I fucked up in there, no save states. Back to square one, grinding my ass off. Then making another attempt. No, thank you. Fuck that. Even the devs of the game despise the Crystal Tower. It was a mistake. It's nothing but trash. Final Fantasy 3 is the best of the NES sponge by a landslide until the climb up that godforsaken jagged dildo. It sucks. And it sucks that it sucks because it knocks the game down so many fucking pegs because of it. I mean, what do I tell you to do? Play the game until you get to the final dungeon, then put it down, that's it, you beat the game? No, you didn't. That just sounds stupid as shit. You gotta finish it, but if you're gonna, it's one of the worst slogs I ever experienced in Final Fantasy. And I did those fucking Zodiac books on A Realm Reborn. No number of quality of life updates through the remake or Famicom original otherwise justifies going through that shit. I can't recommend it. And I know, I know to some, I might be over exaggerating this a bit, but at this point, I'm more than happy to just recommend you Final Fantasy V, which I can't stress enough is just a better Final Fantasy III. Maybe Final Fantasy XII, the Zodiac Age. Final Fantasy Tic Tacs. Final Fantasy XIV with a free trial that goes to level 16 and includes the award winning Heaven Swear. <laughs> Wait, whatever. What? How long was I out? Did we fill yet? All right. Right. Okay, so originally I was going to take a very small break from Final Fantasy after looking at the first three games. I was going to look at them at sets of three throughout the year. I could look at the NES trilogy, SNES trilogy, the PlayStation games, so on and so forth. But uh, I made you guys wait over a month and a half between the second and third game. You know, I feel sort of bad about that. Yeah, I had to deal with the move and all that, but... That was still quite an extended wait between the games. Although I appreciate you guys tuning into that Balan video Russ and I made. Not bad for something that wasn't a versus video and we just sort of gunned. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna extend my first visit with Final Fantasy up until Final Fantasy IV, where it all started with me personally. 
And since I don't want to bite off more than I can chew, I'm going to keep it to one version this time. Now, which version that'll be is something I'll work out when I eventually get to that video. But as always, thank you all for watching. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask if you decide to go outside, get vaccinated if possible, have yourselves a fantastic night. It's good to be back. And please do take care of yourselves.